Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. It's a wonderful privilege to be able to come to a meeting like this and share my experience, strength, and hope knowing that um, the quality of, of speakers is really, really high and, and the quality of me as a speaker is, is, is not so high because of my inexperience. Um, so if, as we go along, I really ask that you bear with me, bear with my nerves, bear with my, um, my clunkiness. Um, but I just hope that someone somehow may be helped in some way as a result of something that I say. Um, my sobriety date is the 1st of June 2020. Um, and so technically I'm entering into my third year of sobriety because today in New Zealand, where I'm dialing in from, it is already New Year's Day. So happy New Year's to, to everyone here. Um, it's actually 10 past nine on the 1st of January 2022. And there's a there's a guy in um in the 24 hour international marathon meeting that says, you know, he says, I've been sober all day and I just love it. Um, I have the privilege and the ability to say I've been sober all day, all week, all year, and um, you know, ever since 2020 um, as a result of, of this program in action. Um, so AA New Zealand uh, got started in 1945 um, by a, a, guy, a guy by the name of Ian McE, as an MCE. You know, abbreviating his last name, he checked himself in, into a psychiatric hospital after trying every every known method of recovery at that time. And he picked up a copy of the Reader's Digest. And in the Reader's Digest, there was an article written by a fellow member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there was a footnote in the article saying, you know, any interested persons or parties who wish to correspond with um, with AA can do so by writing to, you know, PO Box 459, um, New York, and there was a bit of correspondence between him and and, and Bill Wilson. And then in 1946, Bill Wilson appointed this chap Ian McDee as the representative of AA in New Zealand, and he was technically the first me- member. And he went and then he he basically travelled the travelled the length and breadth of New Zealand, carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to those who still suffer. Um, in 1948, the first group of AA was started in a place called Devonport. And that meeting actually continues to meet to this day. Um, by 1951, there were, um, there, were, there were 60 members of Alcoholics Anonymous in the whole country. Um, and that included meetings in, in all the major centers, including my hometown, uh, a place called Invercargill, New Zealand. Um, I don't live there anymore, but, but, I, but I used to and grew up there. In 1948, my dad was born. Um, he was born into an alcoholic family. And at some various times through my childhood, he was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and so that's how I, I came to learn about the existence of Alcoholics Anonymous was through my, through my dad and then obviously through exposure to the media. Um, but it wasn't until you know, I came to AA as an adult that I really understood what AA was all about. Um, so in terms of my experience, strength and hope, um, I started drinking when I was 12 years old. And I believe that from the first drink that I took, um, I, I drank alcoholically because I drank to get drunk. So how did that come about? Well, um, I was staying with my dad and I actually believe that the night of my first drink, my dad actually went to an AA meeting. I, I understand that because when I was staying with him, he would go off, you know, most nights, leave me leave me at home by myself, which was fine. You go to an AA meeting and, and be away for an hour, an hour and a half, and then come back and, you know, carry on with his night. Um, I also believe that he was he wasn't there when I drank. So he was he was somewhere else, maybe, you know, with a with a woman or, or someone. Um, to keep him company or whatever the case might have been. But I, but I was home with my brother. My, nine, my brother was 19 at the time. I was, I was 12. And he was there with his, his mates. 
his, his buddies, his pals, having a, having a party in the house, which was not uncommon. Um, and they introduced me to vodka. And vodka introduced itself to me. And I introduced myself to vodka, to it. And it's interesting that <clears throat> as I as I spend more and more time in, in AA, it seems vodka is such a such a drink of choice. And it's it's hard to understand why, because it's it tastes disgusting. No, nobody, no, especially no 12-year-old, no, nobody for the first time drinking vodka is like, hmm, this is good. <laughs> Just doesn't happen. But it's some um, it's a way of getting drunk fast, right? Um so I took my first drink, and I, I believe the phenomenon of craving that the doctor's opinion um, describes kicked in. And taking my first swig, once once the the taste experience and the smell experience calmed down, I believe you know I was like, "Hey, I, I like the feeling that this produces. I like the sense of comfort and ease that I get as a result of of drinking this stuff." And so I wanted more and I took more and having had more, I wanted more and I took more and having, having had more and I wanted more and I, I could, I had more. And I was actually, I don't know whether this is, this is true or this is just a, um, a, what I imagined occurred at the time. I was drinking on par with these other, with these other people and basically they drank half a bottle of vodka as a 12 year old boy. Um, and the result of that is obviously my body repelled against that and, and led me to uh, what I call a great, a great white throne experience as I, um, I sought the refuge of, my, of the toilet and spewed my guts out. And then something happened as I was doing that. Some mental blank spot, this, this twisted twist in my thinking. I thought to myself, now that my stomach is empty, there's a room for more vodka. I was 12 years old when this thought went through my mind. Now that my stomach is empty, there's a room for more vodka. But I was, I was just, I was too far gone. I was too far down the, down the road of, of intoxication to, to, um, to drink anymore. So I, um, I, I tucked myself into bed and, and, you know, that was, that was my drinking for the night. When I woke up the next morning, I experienced something that no no person um, should have to experience, let alone a twelve year old boy. And that's what I was. I was a boy. I was just I was just a boy. I woke up with the hangover, and it was it was excruciating. And there was no way I, I knew I knew no way of alleviating that suffering. But in addition to the physical humiliation and suffering, there was a psychosocial sense of suffering as well. Because the friends with whom I had drunk, the, the friends who, with whom I had drunk the night before were all gone. And so I woke up cold and alone, smelling a combination of vomit and vodka. Then surely that would be enough to say, okay, I'm not going to do that again. And it seems that's, that's, a, re, that's a catchphrase of, of any alcoholic that's not in recovery. I'll never do that again. You know, I drank myself to blackout, but I'll never do that again. And I drank beyond my beyond my control, but I'll never do that again. And yet it wasn't long before I gave with my brother's friends, drinking and getting drunk at 12 years old. I, but I never drank with my peers, up in, you know, not at that point at least, because who, what other, what 12-year-old boy is drinking? There are not many, if any. My... Drink of choice was obviously obviously dictated by other people. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't buy it, but it was always it was always the highest highest percentage available. If we were drinking beer, it was high percentage beer. If we we're drinking spirits, it was obviously whatever the whatever the proof of the spirits were at that time. Um, but then there were other occasions where it was just it was just your run of the mill beer that I was drinking. Um, 
at 14, um, there was a lot a, a party um, that we that was on, and it was <clears throat> my dad moved around a lot, and he had a, he was having a going away party to to move countries to go and work in a mine um, because it paid really well. And they, they had this going away party, but it was also a surprise wedding for my dad and his, his girlfriend at the time. They thought that, you know, they would, they would do something novel and, and have a surprise wedding. Um, and I was there and, and there was alcohol with plenty. And so I drank. And when I drank, I drank to get drunk. And I had to, I didn't know how I was going to get home, but to stagger my way from the venue to where I was staying. And again, it was it was interesting. My brother was, it was my brother's house that I was staying at. And I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm not, not blaming him for my alcoholism, but it seems that whenever I was, you know, as a teenager drinking to get drunk, my brother was involved. Um, and I staggered my way home and, you know, vomited at some stage. And so then, but then again, the next morning I woke up cold, alone, smelling of, the same smelling of beer and, and vomit. And yet, and, and suffering humiliation, suffering the effects of a, of a hangover that, again, no human being, let alone a 14-year-old boy, should have to experience. But I didn't start out that night wanting to, wanting to get drunk. And yet because I'm an alcoholic and the phenomenon of craving kicked in once I had a first beer, I had to have more. I just had to. And I did everything that I could within the confines of that party to, to drink more. And because of the company that I kept, no one, was, no one batted an eyelid in terms of, hey, there's Brendan, he's having another beer. They were too, obviously not, they weren't, I wasn't the life of the party, but I thought I was. Because he, he was Brendan with these adults drinking with them um, but drinking in a way that they weren't they weren't drinking to get drunk they were drinking to have a good time um, because as I remind my son alcohol isn't bad and the only reason I drink is be- I drank is not because alcohol was the only reason I got drunk is not because alcohol was bad but because I was an alcoholic and drank alcoholically another occasion as a teenager was when I was 16 and I'd um, I got hold of a bottle of wine and went to hang out with my friends. Now they drank, but not all the time, not often. Um, and yet there was this one particular occasion where I got myself a bottle of wine and drank it in their presence. So they weren't they weren't drinking. They had no plans to drink that night. They had no alcohol um, in the house. And yet I drank this bottle of wine by myself with them there. And again, that was that was humiliating. I, I, drinking wasn't on the agenda except for my my agenda. And I drank this bottle of wine and I drank to get drunk and I did get drunk. And, and again, I vomited and again, woke up alone. Um, smelling of, this time smelling of wine and and vomit. I don't know why, I just, I don't know whether I could, couldn't handle my drink or my, yeah, probably that was why I vomited so often when I was drinking, um, simply because I couldn't handle my, my drink. And that was, I mean, that was absolutely the case. I never drank in large quantities, um, <clears throat> but I just, I, I drank to get drunk. And then there was this one last occasion from my teenage years, and I don't mean to, to give my drunk a log, but it's just a, it just helps me put my drinking into perspective. So I've talked about my introduction to vodka, talked about my introduction to beer, I talked about my introduction to wine, and all three of these have involved vomit. Just it just it helps me to understand the humiliation that I was experiencing. Then I got introduced to gin. Um and this was a party of my peers. So this this time that drinking was on the agenda. I was I was invited to this party, and um, the, someone at the party had um, had had gin and a bottle of bottle of gin and a bag a bag of marijuana, um, and I partook partook of both. Um, 
when I woke up in the morning, I was physically sore, like I, my body was aching. And that's because at some st- some stage of the drinking experience, I was, you know, I, I blacked out and I was on the pool table and the people there were throwing and, you know, throwing pool balls at me um, while I was, was, I was out on this table. Um, but I woke up again in this, in this garage or this garage, this garage, cold, alone, smelling of gin and vomit. And I thought to myself, sorry, I'll go back, I'll go back a step. So at 12, I, I said th- to myself after this, the humiliation and suffering, I'll never do that again. And then at 14, I said to myself, I'll never do that again. And then at 16, I said to myself, I'll never do that again. And then at 17, I said to myself, I'll never do that again. And this time I really meant it. I really absolutely meant that I'd never drink again. And I didn't. For three years. I didn't drink for three years. And that was supposed to be the height of my teenage experience. And yet I wasn't drinking because I wasn't drinking. I wasn't going to parties because I couldn't, I didn't know how to socialize without alcohol. So I just become more and more alone, more and more isolated from people. Um, just in terms of, of the book. So it says on page 30, we alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. Now, I challenge that statement because I never had anything to lose. I never had the control of drink to lose. I couldn't, I couldn't control my drinking from the very first um, um, you know, experience. We know that no alcohol, real alcoholic ever recovers control. All of us felt at, at times we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by a still less control. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm three, I'm, I'm, I haven't had a drink in three years. Maybe I can drink again. Maybe I can drink safely. Maybe, maybe my period of sob- sobriety qualifies me to drink again but again when I drank I drank to get drunk and this time I was drink I was buying my own alcohol but I didn't have a whole lot of money um, and so I was drinking what I what I can only describe as alcohol flavored uh, sorry whiskey flavored alcohol so it's basically just a concoction of ethanol um, not particularly strong with with you know a flavored somehow flavored concoction um and it was about 30 proof but enough to get me drunk when i drank and so this this happened so 17 years old humiliated suffering um and then comes to the point of three years and thinking oh okay this i can drink again but that led only to what the book describes as pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And part of the demoralization is I was always drinking alone. Always. Well, not always. 95% of the time I was drinking alone. Um, and that was the case for me. And the reason I share that, share those experiences is because of one of the lines in the book that I most resonate with. So this is probably my favorite paragraph in the whole book. Um, It's page 44. It says, in the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. And that's when I'm trying to carry the message, that's that's what I talk about. I talk about the inability to control the amount of alcohol that I take. It's just I have no control. And it's really interesting. The the AA World Services has just recently updated their website. And on it, I don't know whether this was on it previously, but there's a self-assessment tool. Um, and it's a series of questions and it says, you know, if you can answer some of these questions, you know, you're probably an alcoholic, but I can't answer any of the questions because I never lost a job as a result of drinking. I was never, you know, financially impacted, significantly financially impacted. 
I never drank in the morning. I never, I never did half of the things or I never did. I didn't do the majority of things on that list. And so I hate that. I hate those questions. But what I do love is to ask the question, what happens when you drink? And if they can say, um, you know, if they, if they say that, you know, I can't control how much I take or I can't stop, then I can congratulate them on taking the first step. So that's me saying that that's me admitting um, that when I drank, I had little control of the amount that I took. And that, that says to me that I'm probably alcoholic. So that's me taking my first step. But it says, it says elsewhere in, the, in our literature, we had to concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. And that's the first, it says that's the first step in recovery. So how did I get to AA? How did I get to a point of, of coming to a meeting and, and identifying myself as an alcoholic? Or, and, and, and a recovered alcoholic at that as well. The short answer is I, I'm not 100% sure. But what I, am, what I am sure is I had an experience where my wife's, um, so I'm married, I'm married, been married for 15 years and have a nine-year-old son. And my wife's grandparents live out of town and they were, my wife and my son were planning to go and visit them um, for a weekend. So stay, stay over um, with them for the weekend. And as they were, they were planning to take their trip, I was planning to take my, take my trip um, to the bottle store and, and buy vodka and, you know, get myself drunk. Um, and it, this was, this was an occasion where I drank, um, Again, more than I wanted to, because it led to me vomiting, and so I woke up with the with the probably the worst hangover I've ever had, and I just I didn't know what to do with it. But what it did do is I swore I wouldn't do that again. And as I was nursing a hangover, I believe that I heard not not an audible voice, but a, a prompting of the spirit. Um, giving me two instructions and one of those instructions was to go to an AA meeting at a particular place at a particular time um, and I got the information from the AA world service sorry the AA um, dot, dot org dot nz the website uh, for this particular meeting but I didn't I didn't heed that instruction I didn't go and that was in 2019 and it's really interesting a year later um, I, sh I showed up to this particular AA meeting and, and introduced myself and apologized to the group for being late. Um, I said, you know, I just want to apologize to the group for being late. And the people were sort of looking around at me because I'd, 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 I'd arrived at that meeting on time, took my seat, the meeting started, all that kind of stuff. And it says I was supposed to be here a year ago and I apologize for not coming. Um, so that was that. But so <clears throat> dial back to 2019. Um, I didn't go to AA, but that sort of helped me to understand that I might have, I might have a problem with alcohol if, if this, you know, this this um, this prompting of the spirit is telling me to go to AA. Um, because there was an, there was other experiences following that where I drank and I got drunk. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, how did I get to AA? Is a question. So in 2020, in, in May, May of 2020, the 31st of May, I was in a car accident. Um, I was hit by a drunk driver. And I, I wasn't drunk at the time. So my, my car accident involved a drunk driver, but it wasn't, I wasn't the drunk driver. So I was rear-ended by a drunk driver, um, sustained a significant concussion, um, and... Basically, as a result of that, I couldn't drink. I couldn't get alcohol. Um, and I was off work. I was, I couldn't, my, my ability to function was significantly impaired. And as a result of not working, I had a bit of time on my hands. And, and I, I come to understand that, like looking back and doing a bit of a, a bit of a review of my life, I realized that maybe I need to, to address my problem with drinking. I don't know. I don't understand. I don't remember the process. But I do remember going on the aa.org.nz website again 
And what I was looking for was an online meeting. I, I knew online meetings might be a thing because I had done online meetings for another fellowship in the past. Um, so went on the aa.org.nz website and found what was at the time the New Zealand 24 hour internet, uh, sorry, the New Zealand 24 hour marathon meeting. And I clicked this link and I, I get into this meeting and I realize that there's people from not, not just from New Zealand, but all over the world. And that meeting was, was then eventually renamed as the, the 24 hour international marathon meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. So what started in New Zealand is a little um, a meeting of two people because, on a cell phone because of lockdown it has become an international phenomenon. Um, and it really demonstrates that AA has gone full circle. So what started in 1945 by a, a man with a pen then took AA full circle to what's now the largest AA meeting in, the, in AA's history. It's at the at last our, our Facebook group has 10,000 members. Um, we record a million logins a year. And that's not boasting. That's not saying that group is, is awesome because it has its flaws and, and pitfalls, as, as any, any group of meeting does. Um, but it's what introduced me to AA. Um, I came in and I knew how to read. So I was, I was into the... I got a cop I had a copy of the big book previously from another fellowship I was a member of. Um, and I knew I knew a little bit of the book simply because I have the ability to read. And I was spouting off these things about, you know, the big book and I was quoting from it and I thought I was in recovery, but I wasn't because I hadn't conceded to my foot into myself that I was an alcoholic. Because I'd never been challenged before, I'd never been asked a question. But then I was asked a question and 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 again was asked the question, what happens when you drink? And I said to this guy, I can't stop. I said, I can't stop. Because that was what hap- that was what would happen when I drank. Couldn't stop. And that's demonstrated through my experience as a as a teenager and then as an adult. When I drank, I couldn't stop. Um and this all occurred in a, in, in what we call a breakout room. So, you know, people identify their need to you know, need for additional support and, and, and the meeting sets up a, um, a breakout room and, and someone with more experience goes in. So then he said, um, this gentleman, so he said, what happens when you drink? And I says, when I drink, you can't stop. And then he asked me the question, well, do you believe what's working for me could work for you? And he, what he was pointing to was his reliance on a, on a higher power and his, his um, confidence. Let me just go to that page. Um, his confidence at a power greater than himself was restoring, had restored him to sanity. And he was ask, asking me the question, you know, do you believe that a power greater than yourself can restore you, to restore you to sanity? And I said, yes, sir, I do. Um, because I, I had, I already, I already had a faith. I was, I was involved in, in, uh, in various church communities and, and had a strong faith. Um, but I know, I don't think I was ever confident that, that my high power was interested in in alleviating my alcoholism um, for for whatever reason, and then basically he he led me in the third step prayer. Um, you know, on page sixty three, God, I offer myself to Thee to build with me, do with me as Thou wilt, relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do Thy will, take away my difficulties of victory over them, may be a witness to those I would help with Thy power, Thy love, and Thy way of life. May I do Thy will always. And that was the third step. And then the work began. So this, um, my sponsor, um, and he's the chair of the of the um, of the group conscience for the twenty four hour international marathon meeting. Um, and he's he's in Chatham, New Jersey, and I'm in I'm in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, so we did we did uh, my fourth step via Zoom. And we meet every day and we do a little bit more of the fourth step. And I'll talk about that as, as we get into it. So basically, he, he designed the spreadsheet where you do the columns down. You list, you know, people that you're resentful toward, what they did to you and um, how, it, you know, how it affected you and then looked at my part in it. So we did that. And what was interesting is, you know, we set on paper the people that we were angry with 
And like so many um, people doing the work, the first person on my list was my dad. Because I believe that he had he had passed on his alcoholism to me. He taught me how to he taught me how to drink by observation. So he was an alcoholic. Um I resented him because of one in particular experience where he was drink he drank a box of beer as he was driving, um, you know, as we were taking a road trip and he was drink driving with me in the car. He abandoned me, he did this to me, he did that to me. Blah, 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 blah. And the reason I say blah, blah, blah is because what he did to me didn't, the reason I drank wasn't because of what he did to me, it's because I'm an alcoholic and I'm suffering from a spiritual malady which only a spiritual experience can overcome. And part of that spiritual experience was this was this inventory. As we were doing this inventory, I was taught this, this, this sick man prayer. And my sponsor said, you know, I want you to every day spend some time praying the sick man prayer for the people on your list. And so I was praying the sick man prayer for my dad and I was coming to understand that, you know, what he did was not, it's not that he wasn't culpable, it's that he was suffering from a spiritual malady himself. And that he too was perhaps spiritually sick and that I could pray for him and God would do for, for him what he could not do for himself. But more than that, the this, this sick man prayer, which is on page 67, um, is a way that I that that was proving itself to be a way for me to be able to deal with my resentments toward my father. And I can tell you now that you know, previous to my recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous, I hated my father for what I thought he'd done to me. And you know, I would I would have these recurring dreams of him coming to my house and me smacking him in the face and and repaying him some pain for the pain that he caused me. But now in recovery, and because I prayed that I prayed the sick man prayers so many times for him, and, and had such a profound effect in my recovery, I no longer have those dreams, and I'm no longer riddled by the fear of my father or the or the repercussions of my actions toward him should he show up on my doorstep. It just it works. It really works. Um, and then I worked on my other resentments toward my mother and my brother and my sister and my te- oh, you know, former employers and, and former teachers and colleagues and co-workers and friends. And I can say that I don't, I have no resentments today. They crop up because the pro- my program tells me to crop up. And they do, and they will. And I need, I need the tools to be able to do that. Then the, sec- the next part of the, um, the next part of the, the inventory was the fear inventory. So listing my fears on paper and um, asking myself why I had them. And the reason I had them was because self-reliance had failed me. And that was what I was being asked the question, why do you have why do you have this fear of economic insecurity? Well, because self-reliance has failed me. So what do we do instead? It says on page 68. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. And so this was the next assignment, to take those fear and fears and ask God to remove them and do it on a, on a daily and constructive basis. Now, I had the privilege of doing this um, without, without having a job. So because of the car accident, I couldn't work because of my, my concussion and my, uh, I also sustained a whiplash injury. So I, I, was unable, I couldn't work. And so I had all this time on my hands to pray. And so I'd spend time in prayer every day, asking God to remove my fears and, list, and, and doing it on paper, asking God to remove my fear of, of people. God, remove my fear of people and direct my attention to what you'd have me be and praying that over and over and over and over again. Remove my fear of failure remove my, and direct my attention to what you'd have me be. Remove my fear of of relapse, remove my fear of drinking again, remove my fear of, of, of people, remove my fear of, um, whatever the case might be. And just building that into my day and spending good chunks of my time just praying. And I really believe that, that my car accident was an act of God's providence because it was a means by which I could recover. Uh, I, I could get into recovery. I wasn't willing to do it myself. God was 
God was saying, okay, now I've got your attention. You get it. You're going to go to AA and you're going to get well. Then the next part of the inventory was my harms inventory, look, looking at the people that I hurt. And all of this was, was to re reveal um, a sense of, of resentment, fear, and then in terms of the harm that I caused, guilt, shame, and remorse. And that was the re those were the reasons I was drinking. It wasn't because of my, my brother's influence. It wasn't because of my, my father's influence. It wasn't because of what my father did to me. It was because I was, I was drinking to, to try and overcome a spiritual malady that had manifested and was manifesting itself in those, in those things. And resentment, fear, guilt, shame, and remorse. And the tools of the program, once I'd understood that these, this was the case, where it was enabling me to overcome these things. So prayer, prayer meditation were helping me to overcome resentment and fear, but not guilt, shame, and remorse. Going back to the steps, so, so as I was going through my fourth step with this guy, with the spreadsheet on Zoom, I was effectively admitting to God, to myself, and to another human being the exact nature of my wrongs, my selfishness my um dishonesty my self-seeking and my fear i was being asked to disregard the the wrongs of other of the other per person and admitting my wrongs honestly to, to another human being and that was cathartic that was that was healing in itself to realize that how hey, i'm making this confession and this this admission that I'm I'm not all I'm not all good. Um, that I have these character defects. So we get back into this into this Zoom meeting, and um, he asked me the question, you know, are you willing to have God remove these character defects? And and by that time, because I was aware of them, and because I was I understood that these drove my drinking, I said, yes, sir, I am. I am willing to have God remove these character defects. And then page 75 of, the, of our basic text came into effect. This is, if there's one page in the book that is, is the powerhouse of AA, it's page 76. Because in it, we, we, it, we read about step six. Um, so bef before that, so I just want to read, this is, this is how I did step five. Um, we pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken the step, withholding nothing, we are delighted. So I was pocketing my pride. I was illuminating every twist of character that I'd had, every dark cranny of the past. And I was making this admission to another human being. He had heard it all before. Um, but I'd never done it before. And these are the promises that come with that. It says, once we've taken the step, withholding nothing, we, can, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be aligned at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We ha may have certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. This the next part is interesting because we were doing this on Zoom and I was at, I was already at my at my home. He said, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. So basically, it says we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know Him better. Taking this book down from the shelf, we turn to the page which contains the twelve steps. Now here's, a, here's the interesting part: we were doing this on Zoom, and he said, I want you to follow the the instructions exactly. So it says here, taking this book down from our shelf. Well, how was I going to do that if we we're doing this on Zoom? And he says, have you got a bookshelf? And I said, yes, sir, I, I have it. Yes, sir, I do. He says, take your book, put it on the shelf behind you. So I did. And he said, you know, once you've spent this hour with God, I want you to take the book off the shelf um, and carefully read the five, first five proposals. So the first five proposals are the first five steps. And ask ourselves if we have admitted anything. So I was having a, a time of, of spiritual reflection, asking myself, you know, have I have I um, admitted that I'm powerless over alcohol? Have I come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity? Have I given my will and my life over the, the care of God as I understand God? 
Have I made a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself? And have I admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs? Says, um, carefully reading the first five proposals, we have asked ourselves if we've admitted anything. Um, for we are building an arch through which we had we could walk a free man. And then I asked myself this, these questions. Is our work solid so far? And I said, yes, it was. Are the stones properly in place? And I said, yes, they are. Have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? says, no. And have we tried to make mortar without sand? And I said, no. Um, and then obviously my sponsor said, are you ready to have God remove these character defects? And I said, yes, sir. And then we prayed the sentence there pretty good. Um, and then came the amends. And it took me... So just let me go back to this. So in terms of some dates, I met my sponsor on the 30th of September and finished my fourth step on the 13th of October. So on the 14th of October, I began my amends and finished my last amends on the 5th of April, 2021. So I don't know, I'm not very good at maths, but I don't know how long that is, but it's it's, it's uh, probably six months. So it took me six months to do my amends. And I believe that it took longer, far longer than it did, uh, than it needed to. Um, and the reason being is because I was unwilling to make amends. I was just unwilling. It wasn't that it was too hard. It was that I was, I was unwilling. But um, the eighth step, says we made a list of people we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And so I was asked to pray, you know, God make me willing, God make me willing, God make me willing. And God gave me the will to make amends. And I went out and I made amends. I went, the first amends I made was to my son. And I apologized to him for giving him a bad example around alcohol and putting him in a position. He, he would often put me to bed as a seven and eight year old. Um, as a result of my drinking, I have um, I have sleep apnea, so I sleep with a, a, a CPAP machine on my face, and he would often put it on me, tuck me into bed um, as a seven and eight year old boy. And I said I said to him, Benjamin, I'm so sorry for what I've done, for having you know putting putting you in a position of having to almost parent me. I mean, I didn't put it in those words, but just you know language that an eight year old could understand. I think he was eight, maybe seven. And then I said to him, what can I do to make it up to you? He says, Daddy, I want you to I want you to clean up the graffiti at the park. So I organized for that to happen. And that was my amends to my son. And I said, and then I looked at my financial harms that I was carrying around. And part of it was I'd stolen some IT equipment from a previous employer. Now I now the employer um was no longer in trading in business. So I had to make an anonymous donation to um, AA, the AA GS, GSO in New Zealand. And that cost me a lot of money. Um, I had to make direct amends wherever possible. So I had to go and, and talk to people that I'd, that I'd harmed, including my sister. Um, and I, I, had to, I had to say to her, you need to give me an assignment to do. I, I must do something to demonstrate my guilt, my shame and my remorse. Um, but as I was doing that, the ninth step promises really became, you know, came to fruition in my life. Um, you know, I was being painstaking. It was hurting. I was having to go to my fellows and say I was wrong for the way that I treated you. I had to go to my wife and say I was wrong for the way I treated you. And it, and it hurt. The, the amends wasn't easy. Because it often, you know, at times it, it required me to, I had to take a flight. I had to take a flight to some grave sites because they obviously can't make direct amends to people that are dead. Um, but I can make indirect amends. And, and so I did to my, to my grandmother and to my mother. Um, but here are those nights to promises and these are becoming true. We're going to know a new freedom, a new happiness. We'll not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We'll comprehend the word serenity and we'll know peace no matter how far down the scale we've gone we'll see that our experience can benefit others these promises we these are what one promises that we know 
The feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic security will leave us. That was a big one because it was my immense was costing me money. Um, and there was the potential to to slip into financial insecurity, but there was no fear of that because I was working this program. We intuitively know how to handle situations we used to be for us, and we will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. So on the 5th of April 2021, I finished my last amends, and I believe at that stage I recovered from alcoholism because there was no more resentment, there's no more fear, there's no more guilt, there's no more shame, there's no more remorse, and those are the things I was drinking over. Um, and so if you're in a program and you haven't done those things, then you need to do them. You need to, you need to get into the steps. You need to do it by following the book. You need to, to do your inventory and find out who you met at, what are you afraid of, and who have you hurt, and then do the work to, to rid yourself of those. So prayer, prayer meditation to rid yourself of resentment and fear, making amends to rid yourself of guilt, shame, and remorse. And then, and then what then? What then? What is life like? How do I continue to maintain and increase my sobriety? Um, it says this thought brings us to step 10. So step 10 is you know, continue to make, continue to take personal inventory when we were wrong, probably admitted it. Um, it says, can, this is page 84, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. So you've got to be vigilant, hypervigilant, most, yeah, not hypervigilant, but just vigilant of looking for those things over which I would drink. And asking God at once to remove them, making discussing with someone immediately and making amends quickly for harm anyone. Um, and then resolutely turning my attention to someone I can help. So that's what I do. And I try and do it to the best of my ability. You know, but the book says we're not saints. Um, we have not achieved, we have, you know, progress, not perfection. But I think the biggest part of that is the the prayer meditation um, that goes along with step 11 and then working with others that goes along with step 12. So when I'm in a in a pickle in a in a in a bind in those things, those resentment, fear, guilt, and remorse have the potential to to prop up. One of the biggest parts is is working with others, because um, we read in our literature nothing will so much ensure immunity against the next, first the next the first drink or the next drink. Nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intense work with other alcoholics. So there's one way that I do that. Sorry. A couple of ways that I do that, and I'll finish on this. Um, I do that by doing service in the 24-hour marathon meeting, and I do that by chairing meetings and by doing other little jobs through that. Um, and I go on there and I seek to carry the message. I don't go on there to talk about my problems. I don't go on there um, to, to, you know, to to say, you know, I've had a really bad day and this has happened and that's happened. I go on there to carry the message, and I do that in a very similar way to what I've done now. I seek to carry the message and work with other alcoholics by, by you know, showing up to speaking commitments such as this. But the other thing that I do is, is something called the a, the online intergroup. So that's a, a, you know, a service body that brings together the various groups and meetings, um, you know, that are, that are online. They also have a help function. So it's like a 12th step committee um, that I serve on. So people can go onto that website put a message in the, in the help box and then it comes to a general inbox. And I have the I have a privilege and responsibility to to attend to some of those. So I'm I'm typing away. I'm telling people how to get help. I'm telling people part of my story. I'm telling people you know, how to get to meetings, how to find sponsors, all those kind of things. And that gets me out of myself. And that gets me, you know, into God's will to help another alcoholic. Um so that's, I guess, in a sense, that's my experience, strength and hope. I started drinking young. I started drinking lots. Um, God told me to go to AA. I didn't listen. And then I was in a car accident. Um, and, and that got me to AA. And AA got me to, to in contact with a sponsor. And the sponsor took me through the steps. And now, um, you know, now it's through prayer meditation, um, continuing to watch for those things. Um, and working with others that I continue to grow and maintain my sobriety. So I really appreciate the ability to to serve on this, this speaking commitment. And um, I understand that this is a really strong group, so I encourage you to continue doing what you're doing. And with 26 seconds to go, I'm going to say thank you and um, leave it there. Um, I think I'll close out with a prayer. So um, 
We'll do this the seventh step prayer. Page 76 of, the, of our basic text. God, so my creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.